if there's one thing in, in the, after the loss of a loved one <clears throat> that you should walk away from uh, and, and walk away with, I guess, as you continue your journey and carry on, it is that it is, it is okay to choose to get back up. That it does us no good if we want to stay in survival mode for an extended period of time. Uh, it just exacerbates the pain. Um, but to recognize that getting back up is a portal to the next level of healing for you. You have good days, you have bad days, but those good days actually become more frequent. Hello, and welcome to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. This podcast is about exploring the grief that occurs at different times in our lives in which we have had major changes and transitions that literally shake us to the core and make us experience grief. I created this podcast for people to feel a little less hopeless and alone in their own grief process as they hear the stories of others who have had similar journeys. I'm Kendra Rinaldi, your host. Now, let's dive right in to today's episode. On today's episode, I am chatting with Eric Hodgson. He is an author and a father. He also has a beautiful online community of support. He is the author of A Sherpa Named Zoe, and Zoe is his daughter who we will be talking about. She was 15 years old when she died by suicide. So at this moment, for any of the listeners, if that's something that's still a little sensitive for you to hear, you have the permission to you know, take a step back from this episode. But it is a beautiful conversation that we will be having about more things than that, but more about your learnings and your growth and everything that's come from that experience. So welcome, Eric. Thank you, Kendra. I really appreciate uh, the time today and to connect with you and your audience. I am so grateful that you're here and that you connected with me. And I know we've been on each other's Instagram accounts and following, so we've known a little bit about each other, but I'm glad that now I have you here in our space. Yes. So Eric, let's start with the very just trivial conversation of where do you live? Where did you grow <laughs> up? Let's go into that. I grew up in Maine. Uh, I, my parents are still up there, but I moved in ironically the day that Elvis died, uh, in 1977 and I spent, uh, my childhood growing up in Maine and then experienced different forms of loss when I was growing up there. Didn't really register when you're in your, you know, six, seven, eight years old, uh, growing up through your teen years and all of that. Uh, and then after, High school, I graduated. I went to school up in northern Maine, and then I found myself in Memphis, Tennessee for about three years. And then that was, it was too landlocked. I'm an ocean, I like to be near the ocean. And so I uh, moved back to New England, spent 23 years in the Boston area, and now I am down in Tampa, Florida. You've been so, around. I've You've been, been around. around. I've been around too. Now I get why you made the connection with Elvis, as you're saying, I moved in when Elvis uh, died because mm -hmm. you went to Memphis after too. So yeah, it's kind yeah. of <laughs> well, I did, ironically, you know, Lisa Marie just passed away too, which was, uh, I, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a celebrity. It doesn't matter if it's somebody that we do know. Um, I, I think when you hear of a whole high profile loss, uh, it can still affect you. And that's really challenging sometimes because it not only digs up your own uh, uh, emotions, uh, and uncovers those emotions that you may have had with your own loss, but you do feel connected to it because you get what that family is now experiencing. Not, yeah, it's not only connected to your own loss, but your own mortality to mm -hmm. when these people that you're like, wait, I grew up, I'm I'm the same age as she is, or I'm this, yes. you know, or I, I, or whatever that association might be to this person and this individual. And things, let's say, for example, when it's different artists that have accompanied you sometimes in some of your hard times mm -hmm. if you've been listening to someone's music in a long you know for a long time and yep. they've carried you through hardships mm -hmm. 
or have been in happy moments of your life. Maybe their music played in your wedding or your fifth you know, whatever, a birthday party when you right. turn 16 or 50 and then all of a sudden they're no longer here. It, right. Yeah. It, it's a that's, big, that's what happened. Uh, I was, I grew up a, a huge Prince fan. And in fact, the month before Zoe died, I took both her and her older sister, Arminda to see Prince in concert. And it was probably one of the best experiences of my life. Um, I still consider it a wonderful experience. And yet two years after that, uh, he died. Mm. And so, um, but I think that what's left behind is Prince's music, anybody's music for that matter. Um, that is eternal. Like that for as long as we're going to be able to listen to music, as long as the artist and the music is still, um, able to be shared and played and people are, are connecting to it. Uh, that is, that's a gift that's going to carry on hopefully for generations. And that's just a very powerful thing. And so, but you're right. I connected very much so to uh, Prince's music when I was a young kid, when I was going through other struggles. And so whenever I found myself feeling kind of down or despondent and, uh, you know, very, um, very despair. And despair. Yeah, just despair. It, it was, it was something that always lifted me up. And, and to this day, uh, I was just listening to some music over the weekend, uh, an image of Prince came up on my uh, Instagram feed and I clicked on it and it was a, a clip from one of his concerts. And I was just oh, like, this is just incredible. And so it, it still has that power to lift you up. Um, and again, it doesn't matter if it's your own uh, family member. Like I know you lost your sister back in 96 and then your mom You've in 2016. Done yeah. done <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but knowing that, you know, that, that, that gap in between those losses, there's something that still connects you to uh, your loved one, uh, whether it's music, uh, something that you, they used to share or do together. Uh, Zoe loved the Rail Hot Chili Peppers. She was a big Foo Fighters fan. She just loved music that really connected to her soul. And so every time I hear one of those songs now, I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's kind of like Zoe's coming through. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, and not only, are we connected with them with some of these memories, but we keep on in our, in our case that we've created space and community around their mm. memory, really, you know, created this podcast because of what yes. I've gone through. You've created the communities you've created because of what you went through mm -hmm. and your experiences. Then they live on also through those moments and, and those shares. Now, not everybody, uh, has to do that in order to carry on the legacy of those loved right. ones they had in their life. Right. But they might carry it on through a recipe that they cook mm. and that that's the meal that they eat every time or a song that they play every time and reminds them. Yeah, it's different little things that their legacy lives on in some shape or form. Let's talk about Zoe. She passed away. And how do, how do you like to refer? She passed uh, away, died. Yeah. I had come to, yeah, yeah. I, it's a really good question because I know that the term can be very triggering for some folks. Um, I, I say both passed away, died. Um, uh, and I think either is fine. I've had to come to resolution with that though, mm. because I think when you, if you don't have acceptance or if you're not accepting that the person is not here any longer, it's hard to say that, like, is it, am I really saying that this person died? You know, the, and, and so it, it takes some time, I think for some to, to find resolution to that. Uh, and it took some time for me as well, but that was something that I also noticed quite a bit that, uh, you know, when, uh, when people were referring to Zoe, they started off with saying that she passed away and that that's honestly a term that's been adopted, uh, by our society in the last 30 to 40 years. And maybe it is to soften the blow of when you're talking to somebody about it, because the word dying or de died or death is, it can be, geez, can feel like a real harsh thing to say to someone. So yeah, I, I think either one, uh, either okay one. With, yeah, I'm okay with you. With, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's also, you know, like I, I do, I do interchange the words I yeah. use about my mom and my sister, mm -hmm. but I also use the word transitioned because mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. my, in my beliefs, I feel it was just a shift in 
their reality. And, you know, it's mm-hmm. just a transitioned into another life, another being, even though physically died, there's just a right. transition for me. Right. So sometimes yes. I interchange. So everybody has their way of expressing it and it's okay if it changes, but in, in this conversation, you know, we, we might just interchange the words. Absolutely. So it was two, 2014 when yes. Zoe died by, by suicide. Yes. So tell us the, uh, more about her and her mm. personality and let's then afterwards dive into how you navigated your, your grief. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I, Zoe, I, I would just call her a wallflower is probably too light of a term. I have never met anybody in my lifetime. And I realize that she's my child and, and uh, I may be biased here, but I've just ne- met, never met anybody at that young of an age that needed to connect with others on a deep level. She was not superficial. She would always do a deep dive. And if she could feel like she could connect with you on that level, Kendra, it was powerful because she gave all of herself to you. She was very generous. And I'm not talking about giving somebody 10 bucks. You know, I'm talking about her giving you her undivided attention, her heart, her love. Um, And gosh, that was so powerful. And when Zoe was uh, 12, uh, she she was struggling. She was just struggling with uh, a lot of challenges, I think, in her young teen, her tween years, if you will. And, and uh, she had been hospitalized a couple of times. But what I found was those times when she was hospitalized, the connections that she made with the other kids in these adolescent units I'm still friends with these kids. I'm connected to these kids to this day. I call them kids. They're now 24, 25 years old. And they're just such powerful people. And I don't think I don't think we give teens as much credit as we should, you know, struggling or not. Uh, you know, they're they're learning about the world. The world is coming at them in so many different ways now. When you and I were growing up, we didn't have necessarily access to the to the internet uh, at that young of an age. And and here they are. That's that's what they're kind of shown early on in life. And it's a lot of information. But Zoe was just all about that human connection aspect of life that uh, and she would fight for that. And and there were times she called me out on it too. You know, where I would ask her some superficial questions. She just kind of look at me like, really, dad, that's, that's what you're going to ask me right now. You know, <laughs> but, I love but that. yeah, but more love so, that. yeah, because more I, so. I, I'm going to have to get tips from what kind of way she would do that. Because I was even telling my son the other day, you know, I would really want to be asking you and your sister a lot of questions. Mine are yeah. 15 and 14. Yes. And, but I know you guys roll your eyes every time mm-hmm. I do one of my, con- my talks, you know, so it's hard sometimes to go deep be- with, you know, teens and the fact yes. that she was the one that wanted that. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, I want to take some pointers from uh, her. <laughs> she was, she was just like this. And, and, you know, she, she would often translate what the counselors and the staff were trying to help the kids with because she just understood it at a visceral level. And when the kids were struggling and it seemed like the, the connections between the staff or the doctors or the counselors at these units wasn't getting through to the kids, it kind of reminds me of that scene in Airplane from, you know, uh, where... Uh, Do not make me think of Airplane right now. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's like she was able to translate and she was able no, to... I'm joking. You know, Tell no. me the scene. So Tell the me scene, the scene because it's one of those movies that I watched as a teenager uh, yes. and that I still look at some scenes and cry as I'm laughing. Yes. You know? so, oh, well, the, the which scene, scene? The scene is when um, there's two black gentlemen that are, that are speaking uh, like uh, jive, as they called it in the movie. And the 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 woman that stands up is the woman who played i think june cleaver and leave it to beaver and she's like excuse me stewardess i speak jive you know and then she she kind of does this thing and and she's speaking it fluently you know and they're like yeah you know come on man i i know what i'm doing you know it all it, it was just 
very classic, but that's kind of what Zoe did. She would listen to the counselors. She would turn to the kids. Okay, what they're saying is this, you know, and, and let, me, but she, let me change it to our lingo. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, so it, it, she was just very good at that. And uh, that was, by the way, one of Zoe's favorite movies too, um, Airplane. And so uh, it was just, you know, I, those kids, every time that I went into this unit to visit her and I went daily, she would say like, dad, um, I'm sorry, this is my dad. And so that every time when I would show up the next week or the next day, and hi, Zoe's dad, hi, Zoe's dad. And so it's just, it was just like, she just, it was just very beautiful, the connection that she had. And it, and I had to learn a lot during that time frame. Um, Zoe called me out a couple of times because I was being an overprotective parent at times. And she stopped me one day and I said, Zoe, you got to do it like this. She's like, dad, if I don't make mistakes, I'm not going to learn. I'm like, ooh, okay. Point, <laughs> point taken, kid. <laughs> so I, I'm just, I, I admire, I think she's an old soul. Um, and, and I feel like Zoe is still teaching me to this day, nine years uh, after she, she died. And, uh, and that, that's just a very powerful thing. And I'm just so grateful that I got to be her dad. And, and that she got to meet these wonderful people that I'm now connected with because collectively they remind me of her. You're so lucky that you are her dad. Yes. You are her dad. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So Eric, how did you then navigate your grief? And I know for everyone, it's so different. Mm -hmm. The experience of yeah, how you do it at that moment when mm -hmm. you lost, when you see these are the mm -hmm. type of words I'm saying, she didn't get lost. We know where she, you know, yes, back right. again, you see these kind of lingo that become part mm -hmm. of my own, my own cup. When Zoe died, were you and her mom together at that moment or not anymore? The reason I ask that is because that also plays a part in the dynamic of grief. So if that's okay, and again, you may tell me to edit if that's no. not something I was allowed to ask. No, so no, please. no worry. I'm an open book and I really appreciate the question because I've received that question from a lot of people and no, her mom and I were not together. We had actually been divorced for about seven years and, uh, navigating her grief. Uh, can, if I can say this and I, I don't mean this flippantly when I'm saying it, it was easier to navigate her death than it was for me to go for, through my divorce. And the reason I say that is because I had no coping skills when I went through my divorce. It was the first major setback that affected me directly in my life that I had no idea of what to do about it. And I was in a very bad spot for about three years. And it was, I, I went to therapy. Uh, my therapist kind of had to dope slap me a couple of times. Like, dude, what do you, what are you doing? You know, what, what, you know, she didn't say it like that, of course, but uh, I struggled quite a bit through those initial years after the divorce. I just couldn't believe what was happening. It's like it was too unbelievable to be believable. And because I didn't grow up that way, my parents are still together. Um, uh, my ex's parents are were, were still together. She lost her dad at a very young age. Uh, but um, it was when I lost Zoe. I remember the night that I was driving home from the hospital uh, that night and uh, my sister had come to, to be with me um, and we were in the car and we're driving back to my house, which is about a two mile drive. And I am gripping the seatbelt, like I'm holding on to it as if I was falling. And, and I just didn't want to let it go. And I remembered how I was after my divorce. And I told my sister, gosh, I really hope I do not go back down into that, that, that pit of depression again, because it was brutal. I did not like how I felt and, and she couldn't really say much other than, well, we'll try not to let that happen. You know, she didn't know what to say at that point. She was in shock just like I was. Uh, but I remember a couple weeks later, I was sitting with my therapist, and that was one of the best things that ever happened through my divorce was to get connected to a very strong and very helpful counselor who I had been working with right up through to when Zoe died. And, and 
we sat down and she knew my whole story. She knew my whole background and she's, she knew exactly what to ask that first session. She goes, how are you doing? And where are you right now? And I know what she was saying when, or asking when she said, where are you right now? And I had some time to think about it because it'd been a few days since we had laid Zoe to rest. And, and, uh, um, I think for the first 10 minutes of that session, I didn't speak cause I couldn't. And, um, when I finally could speak, I said to her, you know, um, I've had time to think about it. And I think that the whole, that hole of depression is about the size of an ant hole and I can't fit down in it. So I'm not going down there. And she's like, okay, good. Let's get to work then. Like in a, in a very, very connective way, she said that, and I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but so what, what I focused, what a turn from me feeling really distraught, which I was, to what about Zoe's friends? What about my family? And was it that I was neglecting my own emotions because I was feeling exactly what they were feeling, but I wanted to know that they were going to be okay. Like come hell or high water, I was going to fight for our lives to be better, for better days to come. I didn't know how we were going to do it in those early days and weeks. All I knew is that we had to go that direction because no one else was going to follow suit. And I was pretty clear. Of course, I can't control what other people do, but um, but that they didn't receive it like that. They received it as, okay, this person has our back no matter what. And, and that's, that probably helped me more than anything to know that we were going to find a way to get through this, that yes, it was going to suck and it was going to be hard, but if we had, if we could map this out as we went along, my gosh, we could, we could, okay, look, we have to be okay. We have to understand that grief is hard. We have to accept that the emotions that we're feeling are going to come in. You know, we do have options other than to stay stuck in survival for an infinite amount of time. Um, and we can think about what it's going to be like in, a, in the future, whether that's a week, a month, or a year from now. And, and we can kind of let that aim point pull us in that direction. But that ultimately, yes, we have to embrace that this is going to suck. Mm -hmm. and, and if we, I think if we do that, we're actually building a map through our grief, which is something that. Uh, it's it's just something that I have just gone back to time and time again. It doesn't matter what the setback is that's happened in my life, that process, if you will. So, yeah. Mm. You shared so many things that bring up some questions so or thoughts. So the fact that you had already experienced grief mm -hmm. in a different way, mm -hmm being the end of your marriage yes. and had already seeked help and had those resources mm -hmm. already there had a tool that mm -hmm. you were able to go to. So when Zoe died and had already built this trust, mm -hmm. trust and relationship with your therapist, to yes, help you navigate this really hard moment in your life. Mm -hmm. And that is something to have in mind as people listen to sometimes episodes of like, wait, how come this person's okay? We have this tendency to compare ourselves mm. to others in life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how come this person's so successful in this job is the first time they do this? No, that person's, or, you know, musicians, oh, God, they became, right, right. they became musicians since we were talking about music before they became sensations overnight. No, you do not know how many times they played on the streets mm -hmm. of, you know, for pennies. So we cannot compare our journey to mm -hmm. another person's journey because you do not know what other tools they've used before and other circumstances that they have gone through that have helped them in some right. shape or form exactly. become who they are now to then have some access to tools mm -hmm. to then help them navigate that. So that is something that came up to mind as you were say saying that. And the other thing that came to mind is how you switched it because to some extent, your your mind already knew you had survived something else before. Mm -hmm. right. So you had evidence of, I thought I couldn't mm -hmm. survive that, right. yet I did. There's evidence in my file file cabinet here of my brain to prove to myself right. 
that I will survive this yes. too. Yes. And that is mm. huge. And for anybody that listens to this, try to find evidence in your life of other times that you thought you could not get out or mm -hmm. you did not see a way out. And they do not have to be of the death of someone. It could right. be any other thing yes. that you thought there was a door and yes. yet you found a way through. Yep. So you yeah. did that in your life. And with, so thank you for bringing those thoughts to mind as you're, you are sharing those, those two very poignant kind of uh, ideas for me, like resonated. Mm. So the end, the other part, sorry, as you're saying, the other part is that you also shifted into now let's help. Uh, I, I know I have, I have some tools. Let me now make sure that I grab somebody else's mm -hmm. hand and help them along too, so that they don't end up being in that pit that I've right. been before. And I do not want to go through that pit of depression again. I am going to hold on to their hand so they don't get sucked down by this, uh, Bermuda triangle kind of thing, <laughs> you know, the, the, what is it? The low tide, what is it called? The, uh, when you're, when oh, you're in tide? the ocean, the riptide, yes. the riptide, you know, that sometimes yes. comes below you, yes. you don't even know it's there. So yeah. Yeah. you held on tight to them. So that is also huge mm -hmm. because it's helping others that sometimes also helps us. Exactly. So, oh, tell me, tell me more, tell me more <laughs> than how did you accomplish that then? How did you start then? locking arms with others mm. that were also going through this pain together right. and striving forward. Right. Uh, well, I think the first thing was, and I remember this early on in the process that, um, I, I had this fantasy that Zoe was going to come back at some point, even during the week afterwards, before we even held the services, I had this fantasy that there's going to be this miracle that the hospital is going to call me. There's going to be this hallmark moment. She's going to walk through the door. I'm fine. I'm a little messed up, you know, scuffed up, but I'm okay. But it, obviously that never happened. And uh, I think probably about eight weeks in, I had a major breakdown in my house. I think I cried for about three hours straight because I was trying to accept the reality that she wasn't coming back. Oh, and that really, that was a bite that I don't think any of us who have struggled with the loss of a loved one want to ultimately accept because it's the finality of the situation. You can't talk to them anymore. You can't share with them anymore. Um, maybe you can, uh, and I, I loved how you used, by the way, transition, because I have a very good friend. Her name is Sarah. And Sarah, that's how she refers to uh, the losses in her life, transitions. And and I love it. I think it's very, it's it's a gentle way. It's not, it's not, um, it's not softening it. It's, it's more like, well, it is softening it, but it's, it's, it's actually just an approach that makes it sound so like, yeah, you know what? You're right. They, their spirit, spirit is transitioning from this realm to the next, to the next realm. And so it's very beautiful. Um, I digress. Uh, I, I think the, when I finally accepted I, that's when I started to just turn around and say, oh, I just figured this out that we have to accept this. I don't, it wasn't a, a major epiphany. It wasn't anything new under the sun. It was just the part of my process. And so I would turn and I would share that right away with uh, Zoe's friends or my family. I'm like, you know, how, where are you with the acceptance? And, oh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not there yet, or I have accepted it and it's really hard. And so we would kind of work through those. The next piece was something that kind of caught me off guard. And that was forgiveness. It was forgiving not only that Zoe took her life, but forgiving myself for what I perceived that I didn't do for her while she was here. And as much as I tried, I did the best that I could do with what I had available to me at the time. Tools, um, connections to her, her friends, the resources, the hospitals, the all of it, right? All of that. Um, and I wouldn't say that Zoe was depressed. I would say that she was just struggling to try to make sense of the world around her. And so it was, um, but the, that forgiveness of myself took a little bit longer than I wanted it to. But again, when I figured that out, I shared that, look, guys, we got to forgive ourselves here. You know, you, you, you didn't have that last conversation with Zoe like you said you wanted to. But you said everything that needed to be said and you did everything that needed to be did for her. 
this ultimately was not your choice, you know? And so the final piece, and this is why it applies to this podcast specifically, it was that you had, I had to have gratitude for not only being Zoe's dad in the present tense, like you said, uh, but also uh, being grateful that I was now connected to her friends on a level that I probably would never have been um, gratitude for what is in my life right now. And I was grateful for whatever connections I would have to Zoe in the future. I didn't know what they were going to be. Um, and I don't know, there was something about that, that little three steps that, that the reminder of those three things to, to, you know, accept, to forgive and to be grateful. I just kept on repeating that over and over again. And every time I learned something new in each of those areas, I would turn and I would share it with Zoe's friends in that moment to say, guys, look, I just experienced something here. I just had a dream about Zoe. I'm so grateful. And then we talk about it. And then they would tell me a story about something that happened to them when they were together that I didn't know about. And it just made us all laugh. I'm like, okay, that is the gift that's being left behind by this horrible thing that's happened. Um, those tears start to turn to laughter and good memories. And then her death becomes a moment of transition versus a an, a an everlasting pit. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it it did and so so perfectly. And when you shared of the part of her struggling to really make sense of the world that mm -hmm. she was in, that just moved me so much because even just how you were describing her before and mm -hmm. like, and, and just this maturity that she yes. had and so many of us in general are constantly trying to figure out where do we fit in? Because somehow or another society is designed or be, become a way in which we all have to fit into a certain little box. Mm. And when we, don't then it makes us feel like we're inadequate right so to know that there's a lot of us that feel inadequate walking mm -hmm. around and mm -hmm. just kind of trying to figure it out as we go along in this yes. in this world and for others that are also feeling that way to just know that you're not you're not alone and fe yes. feeling feeling alone let me just put it that way you're not yes. alone and feeling alone mm -hmm. sometimes so many so many do Yes. Thank you for, for sharing. Now, let's talk about a Sherpa named Zoe and mm. explain the term Sherpa. <laughs> it's a Greek Greek term. Is that Greek? Is no, Sherpa? Actually, no, actually, what is what is Sherpa? You, so, you, you see uh, my ignorance here showing up. So go <laughs> ahead. Okay. No, no. Um, I, I, when I, I, I wrote my book back in 2017, and I struggled for a long time. You're supposed to, I, I think, in, in book writing or any type of writing, just so to have the title figured out before you write. Um, but I, I struggled with it. And I think initially the working title that I had was Zoe's story. And, and in reality, it wasn't Zoe's story. It was my story of, of navigating grief and, and then finding a way to get back up, survive first, get back up and then live beyond the loss. And so um, I was having, I went to uh, get ice cream with Zoe's older sister and her brother. And I was, I was telling her, telling Arminda, my stepdaughter, I'm like, what, what is, um, I, and by, you know, I say stepdaughter, I raised Arminda. She's my daughter. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel the same way about her that I feel about Zoe and her older brother, Christos. And so, um, they're just, just deep. All three of these kids are deep, you know? And so I give that trait to their mom because their mom is very connective too. uh, we were having ice cream and I'm like, I can't figure out, like I'm, I'm, I know what Zoe is to me, but I can't put my, I couldn't put words to it. And Armida said something to me. I'm like, it's like, she's a guide. And I'm like, she's a Sherpa. And that Sherpa is a guide. I've always, I've liked the metaphor and the analogy of, of, of climbing a mountain when you're going through struggle. And when you ever watch a documentary on, let's say Mount Everest, but when you go, you see documentaries, you see local Nepalese people who are Sherpas. They, they have walked almost up to the top of this mountain without oxygen tanks. And they walk out sometimes with barefoot. I, 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 
okay, but they know this landscape like the back of their hand, regardless of the size and the distance. And so I have always felt that Zoe has been guiding me. And so when I named the book, it made sense to say a Sherpa named Zoe because she's still guiding me to this day. And it just, it really helped to, I don't know, I just felt like that was the right path, <laughs> so to speak, to, to go on for writing the book. And, and I, the book initially started off as just stories of my experience, um, you know, throughout my childhood and you know, Zoe being born, Zoe growing up with some medical challenges, you know, the, the divorce, I didn't really go into depth at all about the divorce because that's a separate story, a separate situation, but knowing that it impacted Zoe uh, and her and her sister and brother, I, it all, you know, the way it impacted me as well, I just wanted to connect people with what the loss of a loved one uh, could mean for them in terms of, oh gosh, here's the shock of this loss. It just happened. What the hell do we do with this? What do we do with this? And that's the exact questions that Zoe's friends asked me. What do we do with this? What do you What do you mean she's gone? Wait a minute. Like that's not the way this is supposed to be going. Um, I started to chronicle my experiences, those things that just in, imprinted themselves on my mind as I walked through my grief. Those moments when I asked a bunch of questions, some really dark questions that you don't want to say out loud those uh those struggles that that come up that like anniversaries and holidays that you're not prepared for and it's not so much the first year as the second year when they seem to hit you harder um there was okay i i do see that there is some somewhere to go now i want to feel i want to help zoe's friends and my family to get to their better days what do we got that aim point is there how do we get there and so it is so easy and comfortable to stay in a survival mode and it's scary to think of doing anything other than that but survival is meant to be temporary and i don't know about you kendra but every resource that i found online was pointing to survival being the end game of your journey that if you got there good for you that's the best you're gonna i'm not good with that and I know that there are more resources out there that are now going beyond that. Um, I know there's a lot of people that are saying going from survival to thriving and in, you know, at a 20,000 foot level, that that is ultimately what you, what, you know, what, what is possible. Um, but I don't know if there's many people that are helping you get there. They're not walking with you along that path to get there. And that's what I wanted this book to serve as, as a pathway that they weren't alone. Like you were just saying a few minutes ago, you're not alone on this journey. There are others who have gone through it before you that they, you know what? I got you. You're not, you don't have to do this alone. You, you're going to feel alone, but when you can connect with somebody else and they're sharing their story and you're like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Those sleepless nights, those body pains, the inability to eat and the ability to sleep, um, <laughs> the, the, those harsh words that you hear from supposed friends and family that are expecting you to feel better after five months, you know, I mean, just th things that you don't expect to happen along the journey that happen. And truth be told, I, I could never cover all of it. And so I wanted to at least cover the things that I found along my journey in the hopes that there's one thing in this book that will help them take the next step forward on their journey to be like, oh, okay, so I don't have to stay here for that long. And there are things that can help me, resources to help me get to that next level. And so, um, and I think even no matter what, that if, if Zoe was my guide, I'm picking up the torch and now I'm going to be a guide for others who are going through the same thing. It, it's so true. Sometimes we we either think we have to stay in survival mode mm -hmm. or we get comfortable in mm -hmm. sometimes the things that even though they're uncomfortable, that yes. is what we know. And therefore we we can end up, uh, yeah, like there was a, a, one of the guests I had on the podcast and 
she said something about like, not only do you stay in that hole, but you mm-hmm. bring a pillow and a blanket <laughs> and like set up a TV. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, she, she's like, you just make it be the most yeah. comfortable place yes. it could be because you know you're going to be in that hole. So let me just make it be. So no, it doesn't have to be that mm-hmm. way necessarily. It may, again, that survival mode might, time-wise may be different for everyone staying in that survival mode, but just know that you do not have to stay yeah. in that. There is, there is hope. You don't have to, you don't, you don't want to stay. <laughs> we don't yeah. have to stay, right? We don't want to right. stay there. So, How long did you stay in survival mode? I don't know. I don't okay. honestly, because when my sister died, I was 21. Mm-hmm. I was young. And honestly, I do feel that the tools I had from my own beliefs and the support I had from my parents did help me navigate that grief. Mm -hmm. I had experienced grief also just Mm -hmm. a year, you know, several times before, not as close, of course, to a a sister. So that was like the first like major one. But I don't, I don't recall. I think I really just kept going with it. Does Mm -hmm. that make, like, I just carried that backpack, Mm -hmm. you know, of grief along my life. And Mm -hmm. so it just started to get lighter but I you know you just kind of yes. walk along yes. with it and you and I would I did I did navigate with some tools I didn't even know existed like writing to my sister mm. or things like that that was the first one and with my mom the same I I feel that just all these other experiences I had had were proof that I could go through it so I don't think I ever was completely in that survival mm-hmm. mode so as you were then navigating your own survival, helping then others navigate theirs and thrive, mm-hmm. you've done quite a few things in that journey. One has also been a TEDx talk. TEDx? Was it a TEDx? Yes. You know when it's just TED talk, when you put the X. When, so you did a TEDx talk as well. So when did when was that? When did you do that? And how did you do it? Because... Mm. To be on a stage with, you know, talking about grief, talking about your daughter and this very sensitive topic about death by suicide, mm-hmm. please take us into that journey, please. Uh, I speak on that, uh, on that stage uh, in early 2018. Um, I had been fortunate to connect with others in a storytelling forum. Uh, and it was to be asked to share Zoe's story and my story, uh, on that platform was just, uh, I'm immensely grateful for that. Um, I wanted the world to know who Zoe was, you know, I, I, I'd love for her name to be spoken for generations to come, you know, long after my, the, somebody last speaks my name. Um, and so to chronicle uh, through a 12 minute talk, uh, losing my daughter, uh, what I did in order to kind of move through that initial, uh, shock and then to provide three steps, if you will, for folks to follow, uh, on their journey through any loss that they experience in life. doesn't matter if it's the loss of a loved one. It could be the loss of a job, any major setback. Um, I'm hopeful that this talk would serve in that respect and, and, uh, putting that talk together, it is a journey in of itself because you are having to access emotions and recollection of events that you don't want to, you know, you, but there is some major healing that goes in, uh, to, uh, putting a talk like this together. Uh, storytelling actually heals the brain. And so every doing these reps over and over again, it wasn't so much that you're saying it to the point where you're just numb. You're saying it to the point where it's actually, oh my gosh, like at any moment here, I could say the same sentence five times in a row and I'll cry three times out of the five and the other two times I'll just be able to move through it. Um, There was just some, um, it was just a very cathartic experience to be able to go through that. And and believe me, I accessed a lot in that process from the first iteration all the way up to iteration number 26. (laughs) 
uh, you know, and, and finally saying, okay, I'm done writing, I'm done adjusting. Now I've got to get it in my bones. Now I have to, uh, you know, speak the talk so that people understand that this is, this is important, that if there's one thing in, in the, after the loss of a loved one <clears throat> that you should walk away from uh, and, and walk away with, I guess, as you continue your journey and carry on, it is that it is, it is okay to choose to get back up. That it does us no good if we want to stay in survival mode for an extended period of time. Uh, it just exacerbates the pain. Um, but to recognize that getting back up is a portal to the next level of healing for you. You have good days, you have bad days, but those good days actually become more frequent. And then eventually you find yourself doing some things that are, uh, that you would never thought you'd be able to do. I met so many people in the last nine years that I never would have met if Zoe was here. Of course I miss Zoe. Of course I wish she was here, but I've just met some very wonderful and supportive and connective people, mentors of mine now, coaches, and they've all been gifts to my life moving forward. And so, um, you know, there was one tool that, um, and Zoe's friends, by the way, were also mentors for me <laughs> in this journey. And when I was going through my divorce, I remember sitting in front of my therapist one day and I was just, you know, out of options. I didn't know what else to do. I'm like, what am I going to do? And she's like, Eric, you're going to get up in the morning and you're going to put your feet on the floor. You're going to get dressed. You're going to go to work and you're going to come home. You're going to have dinner and you're going to exercise or you're going to watch TV and then you're going to go to bed and then you're going to do that over and over again. And I don't know, there's something about that very simple but direct message that if I'm ever questioning what I'm going to do, uh, no matter what I'm grieving or what I'm dealing with, that movement is going to be really important. Mindset, <laughs> uh, movement, and then finding meaning in that movement uh, will really start to, all of those three steps will really help you kind of take uh, your your healing to a new level. Um, but after Zoe died, a few months, uh, a few weeks after that, her best friend, Jerry, came to me and this kid has been playing the guitar since he was four years old. He is, he's in a band now. He's really good. Um, he, he knows all of Pink Floyd's albums without even looking at music. It's all by memory and he plays them flawlessly. Um, but uh, he came to me. He's like, Zoe's gone. What am I going to do? And that same thought <laughs> popped into my head, what my therapist shared with me. And I turned to Jerry. I said, Jerry, you're going to get up in the morning. You're going to put your feet on the floor. You're going to get dressed. You're going to go to school. You're going to come home. You're going to have dinner and you're going to practice the guitar for four hours like you have since you were four years old. And then you're going to do that over and over again until that becomes the normal thing for you. And uh, I share that in my TEDx talk as, you know, discover your badass self because there, it's in there. This loss, just because you lost your uh, loved one doesn't mean your life is lost too. And so we have to find ways to survive, get back up and live beyond the loss. And we can do it. We don't have to stay stuck. Wow. So many, so many things. So let me ask those three steps that you shared in your TEDx talks, which I have, I have not watched it. Was it movement mindset and mo and finding meaning in the movement or was it acceptance forgiveness and gratitude uh, or neither or none of these none of those actually oh, so uh, as you've said a lot of triads here yes you said acceptance forgiveness and gratitude you mm -hmm. said movement mindset and finding so you mm -hmm. so give me the other triad please <laughs> so the first one is that um you know we, uh, we we're here for a purpose we don't have to realize that um, we don't have to think that we are just existing on this plane and with nothing else um, to do. Uh, we do. We have a purpose for being here. I thought my purpose was to raise Zoe. Um, the next thing is to be your badass self, you know, and, and don't be ashamed of that. It doesn't matter what it is, that you've got something inside of you that you love to do and you can do it. 
Um, it takes time. It takes practice. It takes energy, but that can actually pull you through uh, the loss. Now it may be hard and people, look, I like to work out. Um, and after Zoe died, I, I couldn't work out for months. Okay, that's fine. What can I do though? Right. So, and then fall in love with that again. And then the, the last piece is to, uh, to know that you're not done yet. You know, we, uh, as long as we're breathing, as long as air is going in and out of our lungs, we're not done yet. And so we owe it to our loved ones and ourselves to get back up. Great. Thank you for adding the next three. So <laughs> as they say, it comes in threes, right? Yes, well, you, yes. You've shown this with the battered several things you've mentioned in threes. Mm. Eric, as we are closing off the conversation, I want to make sure I ask you, what have I not asked you that you want to make sure that you share today that our listeners take away? Oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, first of all, I love this conversation. Um, I love having conversations about this topic because we need to hear it more. And so do I feel like we left anything out? No. Could we have another conversation? Absolutely. Absolutely right. Uh, so um, I don't think we've left anything out. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation with you. And I hope that your audience takes at least one thing from it and, and is able to take another step forward on their journey. Just put their feet on the floor, yes. get dressed, <laughs> brush your teeth, go to work, <laughs> come home, have yeah. dinner. Yes. <laughs> go yes. Back home again. The, I just, yeah, there are so many learnings. I took several notes here and as, okay, yes, dogs are, <laughs> are saying hello. Hello. I, I want to also ask you, Eric, about your other communities, the things you offer and how people can get a hold of you. And I'll make sure to add that in the show notes. Thank you so much for asking. Um, there's three ways that you can stay in touch. Uh, I have a Facebook community that's free. Um, this is, I call it Let's Walk Together. And it's a community of like-minded folks who are just trying to take that next step um, but to know that they're not alone. So they can come into this group and uh, they can uh, just ask questions. They can contribute to other people's questions. They can offer things that have worked for them, all with the goal of continuing to walk down the path and get out of survival mode. So that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing is that I have a free uh, early grief guide that uh, your audience can get um, if you go to yourjourneyguided.com. Uh, and then the last is that I'd love to give a copy of my book for free to, uh, to every, all one of, every one of your listeners. Um, I've covered the cost of the printing of the book. All I ask is that folks cover the six ninety five dollars shipping and handling, and I'll ship it anywhere in the United States. Um, but I, I really, I think any resource is, would be very helpful for anybody. And even again, if there's one nugget in the book that they get from it that helps them go to that next level of their healing, that's my intent. I, I just, and I want to make it available to somebody without it being, you know, $14.95 on Amazon or anything like that. I want them to get their hands on it so that they have it. Even if they can't read it right now, they could potentially read it when they're ready to. Or pass it down to someone yes. that needs it. Because yes. it's always just great to have something there because a lot of times we do not know what to say or what to give or mm -hmm. anything to a grieving person. But sometimes just having a resource, a tool yes. that you're able to hand to them and uh, and they will be able to read when it's their time. So thank you exactly. once again. Thank you. Eric, we're so grateful to have you and looking forward to keeping on connecting and yes. learning more. Too. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you again so much for choosing to listen today. I hope that you can take away a few nuggets from today's episode that can bring you comfort in your times of grief. If so, it would mean so much to me if you would rate and comment on this episode. And if you feel inspired in some way to share it with someone who may need to hear this, please do so. Also, if you or someone you know has a story of grief and gratitude that should be shared so that others can be inspired as well, please reach out to me. 
And thanks once again for tuning in to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. Have a beautiful day.